You are now listening to episode 28 of The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. In this episode, Dr. Taylor covers heart disease. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com. All right, welcome to the Real Health Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Taylor Crick. And you know, you can find me on Instagram under the name Real Health Doctor. That's the podcast Instagram uh, account there, and we post some images there. So you guys should follow that. You can also find my clinic online at Align Utah. It's www.wealignutah.com. Dot com And you can subscribe to our newsletter there. That goes along with a lot of the stuff that we're talking about on the podcast. But I'm really excited to bring you today's episode as we are talking about just a very, very important topic. And, you know, it could be argued that it's, that it's the most important topic because it's the number one killer. It's, it's always the number one or number two, you know, sometimes cancer and heart disease, flip-flop. But we are talking about heart disease, okay? We are moving into February soon here. And February, you know, you have hearts up everywhere. You have Valentine's uh, decorations, and it's Heart Health Month. But I believe that heart health should not be just a month because, you know, we focus on it this month, but it should really be something that we're focused on all year long because when you look at the statistics, they are staggering. So what I want to do today is go through just kind of an overview of heart disease, of heart health, of, you know, a little bit of everything when it comes to heart health, we're going to talk about the stats, you know, how, what's happening out there, how many people are, are dying, who, who's being affected. We're also going to talk about, you know, how is it detected? What are the lab tests? What are, they, what are they going to test? Where do you want to be at? HDL, LDL, cholesterol, things like that. We're also going to talk about what are some of the most common medications or how is it typically treated. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how should it be treated uh, and what you can do at home to follow a heart healthy diet. But heart disease w- includes things like, uh, you know, well, heart disease like atherosclerosis, but it also includes stroke. It also includes cardio uh, or excuse me, um, coronary artery disease. That's actually the number one version, the number of form of heart disease, but that includes, you know, several, several different things, you know, like, and heart attacks, myocardial infarctions, things like that. But it is the number one cause of death in the United States. And it kills close to, very, very close to 800,000 people in our country. Okay, that is a staggering, staggering number. And, you know, oftentimes we talk about these numbers, these stats, and they're being so big that, you know, we tend to think, well, it's not going to be me or it's not going to be anybody I know. But, you know, listen to some of these statistics. In the U.S., somebody has a heart attack every 34 seconds. Okay, so since I've been talking, you know, we're coming up on three minutes here. So six people have had a heart attack. Uh, That's crazy. Every 60 seconds, somebody in the United States dies from a heart disease-related event. So in the last three minutes, three people have died. And you still might be thinking, wow, that's crazy, that, but it's not, it's not me or it's not anybody I know. But listen to this one. This one is crazy. One in 31 American women die from breast cancer each year. And how much do we see about pink ribbons? How much do we hear about breast cancer? How much do we hear about race for the cure? And you know, how big and how serious of a problem is it? You know, I'm not trying to downplay breast cancer, but it's one in 31 American women that die from breast cancer, while one in three dies of heart disease. Okay, one in three. Now that one hits a little bit closer to home. Okay, I've been telling patients all this week that I have two sisters, and a mom. Okay, so one of them is, statistically speaking, going to die from heart disease. I have at home now, that's the home I grew up in, at home now I have two daughters and a wife. One of them, statistically speaking, will die from heart disease. So you better believe that we are doing everything that we can for prevention, okay? So we're starting that, you know, with our girls, with the way that we eat and the way that we live, starting that now. And I'll go through some stats in a minute about how heart disease, you know, can start as as young as childhood, okay? But it's actually worse in women. It's the number one killer in women, and it's more deadly than all forms of cancer combined. So, yeah, it's the number one killer. Uh, And it causes one in three, 
women's deaths each year, which is one woman every minute. So those stats I, I just said. And the thing about that is that only one in five women believe that heart disease is her greatest health threat. You know, when you pull women, they think it's it's autoimmune conditions or it's cancer. But, you know, you think of heart disease, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that heart disease is, you know, a 60-year-old man that's under a lot of stress and is maybe balding and has high blood pressure and has a heart attack, right? But it's actually more women than it is men. In fact, since 1984, every single year, more women than men have died each year from heart disease. And 90% of women have one or more risk factors for developing heart disease. Okay, so those are some crazy statistics when you're talking about heart disease. So hopefully that alone just makes you realize that, you know, this is a a very, very serious problem. And, And I'm talking about for you, whoever you are, I'm talking about for your uh, kids, for your parents, for your friends. This is such a widespread problem that nobody is safe. So everybody out there needs to be listening to this episode and needs to be sharing it with their friends, with their family, with the people that they care about and the people that they love so that they can avoid and prevent this devastating disease, heart disease. So coronary artery disease, that is the, uh, the number one cause or the number one uh, version of heart disease. And that, and that can lead to a heart attack. But here's, here's something that's crazy is the American Heart Association, their journal circulation, they actually published a study that, that estimated the total cost to you for, a cor- for coronary artery disease if you get it. And so this included things like missed work days. It included things like if you die early, you know, what you're not going to be able to make and, and what you're going to lose and what your pharmaceutical and medical expenses are going to be. And they tagged it between, you know, mild to average cases being just shy of a million dollars, eight hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars. And the more severe cases were getting up to one point one million dollars. Dollars, Okay. And so if you're not scared of dying early, maybe you're scared of spending a million dollars that you could otherwise, you know, leave to leave a legacy for your family or your kids. But you know, there's so many reasons why you should take this so seriously, whether or not it's, you know, living longer, and just being here on the earth serving a purpose for a longer period of time. You know, that's what we were always talking about is that your health has to serve a greater purpose. You know, why do we want to live a long time so that we can accomplish more, we can provide a purpose for our lives. But also, you know, your money, you're going to lose that uh, if you develop heart disease. The out-of-pocket costs are insane, and the burden to our society is astronomical, so you got to prevent it. So how do they diagnose heart disease, and what, what do they do for it? So, you know, the couple big tests that they do, one is blood pressure, okay? And so normal blood pressure according to medical guidelines, is 120 over 80, okay? And, and, you know, do some research. I don't have the stats in front of me, but if you're curious, one of the most interesting things is to do some research on, you know, who developed those guidelines, who made those guidelines, who says what normal is. And I'm not telling you that if you're on a blood pressure medication to to stop it um, ever, but I am telling you to, to question, you know, some things and to do some research because, you know, I, I'll see a patient that comes in and maybe they're, a, you know, f- five foot tall female. And then I'll see another one come in that's a, you know, six foot four, 250 pound male. And who's to say that genetically speaking, that those two people should have the same blood pressure? I highly, highly doubt that they really, really should. But we put them in this box, we put these guidelines on, we put these numbers on with blood pressure, with cholesterol, with things like that that just determine where everybody should be. And if you're outside of that range, you need to be medicated. And those guidelines are often created by people who have financial ties to the medications that they're going to sell more of. So anyway, they test blood pressure. That's a big one. You know, high blood pressure, hypertension. That's 65 million Americans right now. Okay, that have high blood pressure, that take a hypertensive medication, big, big problem. The other one is cholesterol. So your cholesterol and your triglycerides, your, uh, you know, blood uh, fat, blood lipids. That is a big one that we hear quite a bit about. So I want to go into, you know, what are some of these numbers? What are they measuring? And what do you want to see uh, when you're reading these reading these uh, tests that you guys all know and that you guys all have seen. 
So first are things like cholesterol. So your, your HDL, your LDL, your total cholesterol. So you know the, the total cholesterol, first of all, is calculated. It's not just HDL plus LDL. It's HDL plus LDL plus 20% of your triglyceride level. Okay, so what do those numbers mean? So HDL, that's high-density lipoprotein is what the HDL stands for. That's the good cholesterol, quote-unquote. Now, in my opinion, there's not really a difference between good and bad cholesterol, but most of us are used to that nomenclature, that, that way of talking, so we're going to continue that. So HDL is your good cholesterol, so higher levels are better. When you have low HDL levels, it puts you at a higher risk for heart disease. In fact, more so than having high LDL levels, low HDL levels are a big risk. Now, LDL, that's low-density lipoprotein. Those are the, the bad ones, okay? So you want to have a low level of those LDLs and even some called VLDLs, which are very low-density lipoprotein. The concept is that those are smaller particles that can get trapped and caught in little cracks and fissures of your arteries, and they're going to clot together more as opposed to the HDL, bigger particles that float through your bloodstream and they just don't get stuck quite as easily. So that's your HDL and your LDL. The other thing that you're going to see on that test typically is your triglycerides. Okay, that's the most common type of fat in the body. And your normal tries, you know, vary by your age and your sex. But when a high triglyceride level is combined with bad cholesterol or, or, you know, faulty, you know, wrong ratios of cholesterol, more like it, this can create inflammation, create atherosclerosis. Okay, so what are these things measuring and what is this word atherosclerosis and what numbers do we want to see? So first, what's atherosclerosis? That is placking of the arteries. Okay, so if you picture your artery as being a, a hose, okay, so a hose going to your garden, right? And as your water is going out to your garden, you're getting a healthy crop. Well, imagine if that hose gets a bunch of gunk and a bunch of stuff built up on the inside walls. Or if you've ever used like an old hose that's been out in the sun and it's baked for a long time and it's just like hard and crusty and cracking and just aged, that's kind of what atherosclerosis is. Your body, when you have small slight tears or, or problems within your arteries, it's going to create what's called inflammation. And if you've heard in the past, we talk about inflammation quite often. Inflammation is an immune response and it's a healing process. So, but inflammatory cytokines, inflammation gets sent to areas of the artery to heal damaged parts. Okay, so that's a good problem, but then it keeps happening and it keeps happening and it keeps happening and you get chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation, very helpful. You sprain an ankle, you want that thing to inflame. You get a cut, you get a scratch on your arm. The first thing that's going to happen is you're going to see inflammation around that cut or that scratch. But inside your arteries, you do not want chronic inflammation because these inflammatory particles and these LDL particles will begin to clump together inside your blood vessel and create what's called placking. Okay, so that's basically gunk buildup inside your arteries. Gunk buildup. So as that builds up, as those arteries get inflamed, picture that same hose going out to the crop. As that gets built up with a lot of gunk, that water is not going to get through as well. Same thing with the blood in your arteries. Now, the thing about your crop and your garden is the water's just not going to get through. The pressure's going to be higher, right? That's high blood pressure. The pressure's going to be higher, but it's just not going to get through. There's nothing you can do to really turn it up. Now, the heart, on the other hand, the heart is a muscle. So if the pressure needs to be higher, the heart can do that, and it just works harder, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your heart muscle, each time it contracts, has to squeeze that much harder to force blood through. Okay, so I hope this is making sense that as that artery gets clogged, the pressure goes up and the heart has to work harder. Now, if one of those clogs, one of those gunk buildups breaks free, this can cause major problems and that can cause a heart attack or an occlusion 
of the artery. You can have 100% occlusion. You can have 50% occlusion. You can have an occluded artery that leads to an MI or a heart attack. Okay, so that is the basis of heart disease is this concept of inflammation and atherosclerosis. So the good news is that if you've been a follower of this podcast, if you lead an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, guess what? Your risk of heart disease is very, very low. In fact, in other countries where they just typically their culture tends to lean towards a more anti-inflammatory lifestyle, higher in omega-3s, higher in, you know, no processed foods, things like that, their heart disease risk is considerably, considerably lower than ours in the United States. So it's all about your lifestyle more so than your genes. Okay, so that is important. So maybe you had a dad or a mom or a grandma or a grandpa, or maybe you had it on both sides, or maybe, you know, you've lost a brother at 45 to a heart attack or something. That does not mean that you are destined to follow that same path. Okay, you can change that. The power is in your hands, the control is in your hands. And you can change this immediately starting today with your lifestyle. So with those numbers, you know, what do we want to see? Well, let's start with the HDL. That's the good cholesterol. So, you know, low, on the low end is 40 to 50. That, that's low. Uh, 60 to 70 is a little bit more desirable. Anything above 60 is starting to get pretty good for the HDL. Okay, the LDL, normal would say would be 100, uh, or, or excuse me, like, yeah, I mean, 100 to 130, and then when you're starting to get up to 160, that's high. Okay, so 160 is high for LDL, 190 is too high. It's excessive. Anything below 40 for the HDL is excessive. That's a red flag area. Now, with those two together, plus the 20% of the triglycerides, when you look at your total number, 200 to 240 about 200 is what they say is desirable. 240 is completely fine in, in my opinion. But once again, you know, consult your medical doctor for this. This is not, I'm not reviewing your labs right now. I'm just telling you my opinion of where I'd like to see these at. When you look at those triglycerides, normal is about 150, you know, below 150. 200, borderline high above 200. Then you can get up into the 500s. You can get really, really high. So general rule of thumb, total cholesterol, you don't want it to be really more than 180, but I'd say that that's, that's questionable. And the LDL, you don't want it to be really uh, more than, than 100 um, is what they're saying. And that's for people, that's, excuse me, with pe- for people with established heart disease or diabetes. But those numbers are, are pretty questionable. You can read a lot about those. And, you know, we're even going to have some upcoming episodes about saturated fats and things like that and the specifics about cholesterol and statins. So make sure that you tune in on those. But what I want to talk about more importantly, in my opinion, than those numbers, than those frank numbers, are the ratios. Okay, that is more important than the numbers. That's why I'm not giving you, you know, exact guidelines because I, I quite frankly don't care what the medical uh, guidelines are because those have been, you know, kind of doctored. Uh, so I want to tell you how to uh, look at your ratio. So say you have your lab results, which, you know, everybody, a lot of people have, or you can get access to them. There's a couple different ratios that you want to look at. Two ratios in particular. The first one is your HDL, so that's your good cholesterol, to your total cholesterol ratio. Okay, and so what you want to do is you want to divide HDL, so you put HDL on top, and you put total cholesterol on bottom. So say, for example, your HDL is 60 and your total cholesterol is 200. That's a 30% ratio. Now, where you want that ratio to be is above 24%. So say another example, let's say your HDL is 40 and your total cholesterol, once again, is 200. That's only a 20% HDL to total cholesterol ratio. So you want to make sure that those HDLs are high. That's more important than the total cholesterol number because see that total cholesterol number stayed at 200 in both of those examples, but the HDL number changed. So you want to make sure that your HDL is at least 24% or, you know, roughly a quarter 
of your total cholesterol number. So when you look at those two numbers that, that are right there, just make sure that it's a, about a quarter or higher for that first ratio. Uh, big marker for, for heart disease risk factor. The other one is your good cholesterol and your triglyceride ratio. So that one you want to take your triglycerides on top and divide them by your HDL. So like, for example, let's say your triglycerides are 150, okay, 150 triglycerides and HDL of 50. That is a ratio, triglyceride to HDL ratio of 3. Now you want this number to be lower than 2. So that is bad. That's too, that means your triglycerides are too high and your HDL is too low. Now let's say, you know, more ideal numbers, your triglycerides are 100 and your HDL is at 60. That's a ratio of 1.67. That is good, so it's under 2. So with both of those ratios, the, the number one thing that's the most important is that the HDL is high. So that's what you want to look at most of all when you're looking at your lab results is that the HDL is high. Then you also want to keep your triglycerides low and then your total and your LDLs low. But the number one thing that determines both of those ratio factors is a high HDL number. And, you know, those numbers get a, a lot of publicity, and cholesterol gets a lot of publicity. So we're going to have some articles and possibly another podcast episode specifically on cholesterol. One of the things today is that, you know, it's even fast rising in children, that kids are getting put on these statin drugs. And, you know, they're the most successful drugs of all time. So there's a reason why the pharmaceutical industry wants the kids to be on them. But it's also, it's true that children are developing heart disease. They did a study in American, you know, they've done several in different countries, different autopsy studies on kids, and they've done them on American kids too. So these are kids that got in car accidents, and they did autopsy studies. Of them. So these are 10 to 14 year olds, and 50% of them had already begun to develop atherosclerosis or plaquing in their arteries. Okay, so that's insane. And we always think about these things that happen in, in middle age. You know, heart attacks happen in middle age most typically. Well, they don't begin then. You know, back pain, the number one cause of disability worldwide, often might begin in middle age. But another study showed that roughly 10% of 10-year-olds, this is out of Britain, have, are already showing signs of intervertebral disc degeneration. Their discs, they're not even fully done growing, and their discs are already starting to degrade and rot and degenerate, okay? And that's the same with heart disease. It starts in kids. So that is insane. So you got to keep an eye on your lab values. Uh, the next podcast episode is actually on uh, omega-3 and omega-6 ratio. So that's another lab value, but that's a little more uh, in-depth, next level for heart disease. There's a lot that you can pick up on just from your typical uh, run-of-the-mill lab tests that you get at your annual physical. So what do most people do when they've been diagnosed with heart disease? What are most people taking? What are most people doing. Okay. So, you know, the first one I'd say is aspirin, right? Because we've heard that for years and aspirin a day keeps the heart attack away, things like that. Well, you know, a recent study out of Japan studied over 14,000 people, which is a huge number. Age 60 to 85, it found no major difference in heart-related deaths or non-fatal heart attacks and strokes between people who took aspirin and those who didn't. Okay, so it, it, it made no difference whether or not you took aspirin. Now, are they going to encourage you? Yeah, and have they always said to take an aspirin? Yeah, but who's telling us that, you know, Bayer? I, and when you look at aspirin, too, it's not just that it's, oh, it's baby aspirin, it's harmless, I might as well take it just in case it's going to help prevent. No, it's been linked to things like increased stroke, stroke risk, increased internal bleeding. So that's not something that you really want to necessarily mess around with. So aspirin can actually lead to an increased risk of heart disease. Another one that can lead to an increased risk of heart disease are our NSAIDs, or your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are things that as common as Aleve. Aleve is highly, highly 
linked. Okay, so the research is pretty cut and dry on Aleve or naproxen, uh, but also things like ibuprofen, uh, Advil, aspirins, and NSAID. Another one's like Viox. Viox was pulled off the market years ago in 2004, but it's it's estimated to have caused between 88,000 and 130 to 140,000 heart attacks. And they found out it was a massively, massively popular medication. They found out, they pulled it off the market. They also found out that Merck lied about it. They got slapped with a big lawsuit. You can look it up. It's V-I-O-X-X. And it's estimated that Viox killed more Americans in five years than the Vietnam War did in 10. Okay. And one of the things that I hate about Viox is that my mom took Viox. Okay. And she's fine. But what, what did it do that we don't know about? You know, so you, you want to be very, very careful with even these over-the-counter medications like ibuprofen and Aleve. They have long-term effects, including increased risk of cardiovascular events or heart disease. But what are people taking once they've been diagnosed? Well, a lot of people are taking statins, okay? And that is the, uh, the cholesterol-lowering medication. And, you know, it's 40 million people, and it's a $20 billion industry. In fact, Lipitor, one, one statin, simvastatin, Lipitor, is uh, the highest-selling medication, the most successful medication of all time. And it's been shown that it does not decrease the risk of heart attack compared to placebo. Uh, so that's a, a big one. You know, go back to our podcast called Side Effects, where we talk about these things in in detail. But you know, the statins they're going to lower cholesterol in a blood test, but they don't decrease the risk of mortality, and morbidity, and the research has shown that. Many review studies have been published showing that you know just the lack of efficacy in preventing heart attacks, and most importantly, preventing death. Okay, and one review here's a review that I have in front of me. It found that th- this is a quote. The current clinical evidence does not demonstrate that titrating lipid therapy, which is trying to lower cholesterol with statins, to achieve proposed low LDL cholesterol levels is beneficial or it's safe. Okay, so another one has shown that statins have not been shown to provide an overall health benefit in primary prevention trials. So there's study after study after study after study showing that these statin drugs don't work. So not only are they not effective, not only would I not take one, even if I thought I was going to have a heart attack, I would not take one because I don't think that they work. But even on the other side of that, statins have been scientifically linked to over 300 side effects. So you hear more today about the side effects than you do about the drug treatment because so many people have been on them for so long term. They're getting things like memory loss cognitive loss. You know, I, we got my grandma off her statins at one point and names started coming back. Things started coming back to her. And muscle loss. Okay. So they deplete muscle, the muscle loss, which includes the heart. Okay. The heart is a muscle. So it can cause something called rhabdomyolysis, which is eating away of muscle. CoQ10 depletion depletes CoQ10, which is a necessary cofactor for your energy, your electron transport chain, things like that, leads to diabetes, leads to cancer, leads to erectile dysfunction. These are all research-linked side effects of statins. Okay, so that's a big one. That's for your high cholesterol. The next one would be your blood pressure medication. So a lot of people taking high blood pressure medications, which can include things like ACE inhibitors. Uh, and diuretics. Okay, so ACE inhibitors, it blocks the action of an enzyme that breaks down something called bradykinin. Okay, and bradykinin relaxes arteries. So basically, ACE inhibitors block the breakdown of something, and so they cause relaxed arteries. And that can lead to a lot of side effects, headaches, dizziness, fatigue, nausea, dry cough, swelling of the face, tongue and throat, impaired kidney function. In fact, a lot of people are taking something like an ACE inhibitor and maybe a diuretic like HCTZ is a common diuretic and an NSAID. So one of those uh, anti-inflammatories that we just talked about. And the medical literature describes this as a triple whammy of kidney failure. Okay, because these medications have never been studied together. They've never done a study of what they're, you know, how those chemical, the cocktails are reacting in your body. Plus, people that are going to be on those three medications, they're probably not going to be just on those three. They're probably going to be diabetic. They're probably going to have pain. They're probably going to be on at least 
six to 10 total medications if they're starting with just those three. So you got to be really, really careful with heart medications, not only them by themselves, but mixing and polypharmacy, poly polypharmacy, which is, you know, just having too many drugs that your doctors aren't working together. You don't know how they're reacting and they're creating disease in your body. A lot of people, once they've, been, once they've had a heart attack, will take a combination of drugs, which might include like uh, an aspirin, a baby aspirin, which you know, blocks the blood's clotting mechanisms, an ACE inhibitor, which we just talked about, that relaxes the arteries, uh, a beta blocker, which slows down the heartbeat, and a statin that helps lower the cholesterol. So all of these things, to, let's relax the arteries, let's... Uh, Let's break down the clotting mechanisms, which causes other things. Let's slow the heartbeat. Let's lower the cholesterol. They're taking all these chemical approaches to fix this problem and not looking at the true and real cause. So what is the cause of heart disease? What is the cause? What can I do? Well, the cause is inflammation. Okay, inflammation. So you can go back and listen to past podcast episodes about inflammation and about what you can do. A couple of the things that you can do. I'll give you a few pieces of advice to just end this uh, episode on heart disease and let you know what you can do. Number one, exercise. Exercise, exercise. You know, exercise has been shown, just 15 minutes a day of exercise was recently shown to increase your life expectancy by three years. Okay, and that includes people with cardiac risk factors. Uh, exercise, if you picture it, you know, we picture that hose and that gunk buildup. And that, you know, if the blood isn't being pushed through there, that gunk's going to build up more. And the heart's going to have to work harder and it ages faster and things like that. So, I mean, just doesn't it make sense to, to exercise your heart, to strengthen it. You know, your heart is a muscle. It's just like your bicep. By doing curls with it, it gets stronger. It can handle more. It gets less stressed. And it, it, it's just healthier. So exercise is a no-brainer to decrease hypertension, to decrease uh, bad cholesterol. That is a no, no-brainer. You have to be exercising. And then the other big one is diet. You know, honestly, the American Heart Association isn't too far off on their, their recommendations because what they say is, you know, eat a heart-healthy diet. Eat an anti-inflammatory diet. Take things like fish oil. Go for a 30-minute walk every day. Things like that that are recommended are really, really good pieces of advice, but they're really, really basic. But still, if we could get some of the people – in fact, a study just came out that said that if we could get some of the people to just lower their risk factors – a third of heart disease deaths could be preventable, a quarter to a third. Okay, and that is staggering because when you talk about that, that's talking about hundreds of thousands of deaths each year, hundreds of thousands of deaths each year that could be prevented just by getting rid of some of these risk factors, just by losing weight, just by lowering your triglycerides, just by lowering your insulin and your resting blood glucose level, massive, massive implications for heart disease and for mortality and morbidity. So you can do that through exercise and diet. Okay, now go back to past episodes to find out what you're eating that's making you inflamed. The number one and the number two sources of inflammation, number one is sugar. So go back and listen to the sugar episode, and we talk about it in a lot of the different episodes, but there's one particularly just on sugar, and you'll learn where it's coming from, what are the sources, how is it sneaking into your diet, and how is it creating creating and fueling not only heart disease and inflammation, but also cancer, diabetes, the top three killers, all are being fueled by sugar. And then the number two thing that's fueling this inflammation are bad fats, damaged fats, inflammatory omega-6s, low omega-3 levels and high omega six levels. That is fueling our inflammation. They've done studies comparing us with other countries that have lower omega-6s and higher omega-3s, and their risk of heart disease is virtually non-existent compared to ours. Now, there's a lot of other things that are out there that you can do 
for heart disease. There's supplements, okay? Fish oil, vitamin D, CoQ10 are the best ones. There's a lot that you can do, you know, as far as lifestyle. You can do meditation or yoga. It's great to just decrease your stress response and lower that heart rate, lower some anxiety, lower your blood pressure. There's so much out there that you can do, but it starts with the basics. And the basics have to start with an awareness of how big and how huge of a problem this is for you, your family, your loved ones, and everybody out there. So please take this seriously. Stay tuned to the podcast. Stay tuned to the newsletter. Check the show notes and read the article that goes along with this episode to continue learning more about what you can do and what you should try not to do to help yourself avoid heart disease and maybe even reverse it if you've already been diagnosed. So once again, you guys, this is the Real Health Podcast. This is Dr. Taylor Crick signing off today about heart disease. Everybody needs to have a healthy, healthy heart and have a good heart health month in February, but then the rest of the year too. And if you're listening to this episode in September or October or December, it does not matter. Heart health should be every month. So once again, stay tuned, follow us on Instagram, click the links on YouTube, on the website to find out more information. And we're going to keep bringing you more in 2016. It's all about transformation, not just information. So once again, Real Health Podcast, we'll talk to you guys next week when we talk about omega-6s and omega-3s. I'm really excited about that topic too. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.